Hello and welcome to today's webinar uh, on embedded Linux boot time optimizations. My name is Stefan Eichner. I work as a Linux development engineer at Toradex. This webinar will consist of uh, four parts. First, something brief about Toradex in general. Then something um, about how a typical Linux boot process looks like. Then we will see uh, some hands-on um, work and in the end there will be time for questions and answers. So Toradex is located worldwide. Uh, our strength is we have direct sales through local sales offices, we have local um, stocks and free premium support. We provide system on module or computer on module which uh, improves the time to market, uh, reduces development risk and optimize costs with economies of scale. We have two families, uh, a bit the larger one, the Palace family. The Palace family's main um, difference to the uh, uh, Colibri family we will see later is it also has uh, high-speed interfaces such as PCI Express, SATA and Gigabit Ethernet. So if this is your requirement then usually the Palace family is the way to go. The Colibri family is a bit uh, the smaller form factor. It's uh, ideal for um, lower end um, applications. And uh, in this family is also the Freescale Fibrid um, modules. We have the Freescale uh, VF50 and VF61, which we will mainly use in this webinar for these uh, boot time optimizations. So now, how does a Linux boot sequence looks like? So on power on first, uh, the hardware reset uh, takes place. This is uh, completely in hardware, so the SOCs and uh, some chips on the module or also on the carrier board uh, gets resetted hardware-wise. Before then, the um, CPU really kicks in and starts to execute the boot ROM. So the boot ROM is a piece of software which is inside uh, the SOC, so inside the chip on the module and can usually not be altered by, uh, by developers or by the customers. So this is a, a piece of software which is written by the SOC vendor usually and it loads usually the bootloader from its boot device. Then the bootloader uh, usually on Linux U-Boot uh, is going to be started. The bootloader uh, loads the Linux kernel and the device tree nowadays. Then the Linux kernel initializes all the hardware and hands over uh, the control to the user space um, at the end of its linear boot process. So the user space then starts uh, various applications and does some more initialization until in the end the user space application or the, the user application is started, which is um, maybe a, a login screen for a desktop or which might be for an embedded device, some kind of UI or maybe just uh, like a, a web server for a network device. And then hopefully the user can access or use this uh, user interface and um, be happy. The very beginning, the hardware reset is actually consists of two parts. There's some power sequencing, so there are um, different rails which are powered up, then the hardware reset is taking place. And the boot ROM also does uh, some different things. There is a hardware initialization like clocks and caches. Then it uh, initializes or finds the boot device before it uh, loads the application image, which is usually the bootloader. So the time to load that application image or bootloader is uh, proportional to the size of the image, of course. So a smaller U-boot usually gets loaded faster by the boot ROM. So this is the very first part, which we usually cannot really influence. Uh, that's just kind of given by the hardware and by the SOC vendor. Also, I did here a small measurement how long this initial um, phase um, takes on a hybrid. So we see here the yellow line is at the power, and the blue line is actually the um, the transmit uh, line of the of the debug UART. And we see here the um, characters which um, being sent from the module. So um, the time between the reset or between the startup 
of uh, of the power and the first characters being sent uh, is uh, in this example uh, somewhat below 40 milliseconds. So this whole boot room and reset phase is quite short usually. It depends on the module. Some modules have a bit longer. Um, for instance, the iMix 6, it's about 70 or 60, 60, 70 milliseconds. Um, it also depends a bit on the complexity. Usually more complex systems have a bit longer reset timings. For instance, when PCI Express comes into play, that also needs some time to um, to reset. So then usually this time is a bit higher, but still it's it's in, in the milliseconds range usually. Then in the second part, the bootloader um, is being executed. So the bootloader on its own does some hardware initialization again. Um, in the hybrid case, it also initializes the main memory, the DDR memory. It relocates itself into the DDR memory, does some more hardware initialization, like for instance, um, finding the um, boot device, the, the uh, non-flash chip, and does then um, loads then the kernel and the device tree. And here again, the time it takes to load the kernel is act actually proportional to the kernel size. So a smaller kernel helps to improve the uh, bootloader's boot time. Then the bootloader is handing over the control to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel does some early init too. Um, for instance, um, it initializes the whole memory, the caches, the, uh, the interrupt controllers. Before then, basically a, a linear boot process is being executed where the drivers and all the peripherals are being initialized. At the end of this phase, the root file system is, uh, is mounted and the init uh, process is launched. At that point, the kernel uh, then steps back, so it's not a linear boot process anymore. The user space takes over. The init process does the, um, um, does the further initialization. Nowadays, the um, typical Linux um, distributions or server boot process looks a bit more complex. Typically there is a init RD, so a init RAM um, disk, which is being mounted by the kernel directly, and a small init process within that RAM disk is being executed. The reason is uh, for that is that nowadays systems are getting more and more complex, so uh, finding the root file system and mounting it, for instance, from from a fiber channel um, hard drive or for, from a RAID um, disk, it's more and more complex. So that's why basically usually the um, kernel brings a init RAM FS and mounts then the real root file system. So on a typical Fedora or Ubuntu, the boot process looks a bit more complex. But in our BSPs for, and for embedded use, we typically um, use the simpler um, boot process which directly mounts the root file system. So and in the end, uh, the user space is basically executed. This could be just the application. That's not usually usual the case, but theoretically one could just start the application. Typically, um, there's an init system which, which um, does some steps uh, which are needed for a full working Linux system. For instance, it mounts some basic um, file systems such, such as the uh, slash proc or slash sys file system. It loads the kernel module. It um, initializes the network. Maybe initializes uh, journals or uh, system lock. Uh, loads the RTC. So there, there could be, there are a lot of steps which can be um, required for the application or maybe also not. So there, there's a, uh, there's a lot um, boot time optimization potential by stripping down this uh, boot, this uh, user space part to the bare minimum, basically. We are going now to the hands-on part. You should see the video now. Here it is about, this more or less follows the um, blog post which I did earlier about the embedded Linux boot time optimization. One of the main utilities you are going to use is um, a utility called uh, Grab Serial. So I have this from this GitHub website, and I already have it downloaded here. So that utility helps us to uh, measure the time it, uh, it requires to boot uh, something. 
So first I'm using screen here, so my terminal emulator to connect to the device. So I'm now connected over the serial console to the device. And I'm going to just um, flash our default Linux um, system with a run set update and run update. So this flashes our standard image onto the module. Okay, this is done. Now the system boots up. We see here timestamps. These timestamps are from the Linux kernel. And you see here um, the system is doing some initial initialization. For instance, this uh, UBIFS is doing some uh, free space fix up, so it's preparing itself on the first boot. Also, the packages, so the O package uh, manager does some um, initial um, initialization. So the first boot takes usually a bit longer here, it was around 21 seconds now. So I'm going ahead and reboot the device right away to see how fast it is in the second boot. So this is um, with the systemd user, our standard image comes with the systemd user space. We see here that now the second boot is already a bit faster, it's 14 uh, seconds. According to the Linux kernel measurement, this is not uh, quite accurate from the beginning, So, but it gives a hint where, where we stand, more or less. So now we are going to use uh, grab serial. So grab serial as uh, a help output, so we, we, we will use the dash D um, option to specify the, um, uh, the, uh, the TTY device, uh, TTY USB 0 in our case, and the dash T um, command enables the timestamps at the beginning. So we see here now we have basically two or even three timestamps, and the left two, they are generated by grab serial. So on the, on the local side, on the host side, these times are uh, generated when, when a line ap um, appears over the serial console. So we see here that uh, starting kernel is about 1.8 seconds after start. We see that system D is around 5 seconds. And we see on the right side, it's the, um, the Linux kernel's timestamp. So there's a bit of a difference between these two timestamps. The overall boot time is now around 15 seconds. With that, we use now a special, an, another option, uh, dash M, which, um, a dash Q, sorry, which actually um, uh, stops the uh, measurement of the grab serial um, um, command. So um, we stop now the measurement as soon as the kernel get started. So starting kernel is still printed by U-boot. That's basically the last message of U-boot. So we see now we are just below two seconds. Of course, one of the, uh, the normal U-boot uh, waits for one second for the user to interrupt the boot process. We can disable this uh, boot delay by using set boot delay zero and save that to the environment. And with that, we already um, should be able to shove away one second of boot time. I'm going to use grub serial again, reset the board, and we see we have now 0.9 seconds. So already one second saved. When you compare to four, we see hit any key to uh, stop auto boot, and the next line is one second delayed. So we basically added one head one second delay according also to these uh, grab serial measurements. Compared to the new value, there is no delay there, so we saved one second. Yeah, we see on the right side here, it's for DDR initialization, it takes about 70 milliseconds, so one can really see which steps here take some time. However, some things are almost not uh, optimizable. Here we have the kernel, for instance, it takes uh, 380 milliseconds to load the main kernel image. And this is, on the left side, is the total time. So the relative time on the right side and the total time on the left side. So we are going to use this um, utility through, through, our, through this uh, webinar. So it's important to kind of understand what these values mean. I do have um, the source uh, checked out for U-boot here. So this is from git.torvex.com. Um, I compile U-Boot uh, outside of the open embedded uh, build environment just because it's easier for development and so on. 
So there's also on developer.torodex.com uh, um, documentation how to do this. So the um, I have a command Linaro. This is not a magic command. It just basically um, sets up my um, my um, development environment. I can show you this file here. It sources this file, so it sets the arch path and cross compile environment variable. Uh, so I'm able to basically um, use uh, make to build um, uh, to cross compile um, the um, you boot, uh, the bootloader here. So with make colibri underscore vf uh, underscore def config, I'm going to um, load the default configuration we have in our uh, VSP. And with make j4, I'm going to compile uboot. So I. Uh, put in the SD card here. So these are our um, standard um, flashing scripts. With the latest release, we also create a subfolder. So in these subfolders are the things which we are going to flash uh, on a on a module. Uh, I'm interested in uboot, so I'm going to replace that uboot here. Um, however, right now the uboot. Um, I, I did not any change to the uh, uboot source code, so that's actually not interesting yet. So I'm going to alter the configuration, which is lo located under include configs colibri underscore vf dot a. So this is the uh, uboot or the bootloader's uh, configuration. We can, uh, by removing or adding defines, we can uh, alter the behavior of the uh, of the uboot bootloader. So I'm going to set the boot delay to zero by default. So I don't have to set the environment variable. And I'm also going to add some of, uh, some uh, other configs I have prepared here. So one config is um, silencing the U, uh, UPI uh, messages. And we are going to enable the level two cache. This only works for VF61. So VF50 does not have a level two cache, but Let's assume my project only uses the VF61, so um, we can make use of this uh, level 2 cache. I'm going to generate the config again and start the build process. So I'm on the module here prepared to load the um, new U-boot. So this is the path of the SD card. I'm going to copy the U-boot uh, uh, binary to the target. So here we have the new binary on the SD card. I'm going to um, put the SD card into my target system. So I have an evaluation board here, reset again, and use run set update and run update uboot to actually uh, flash the bootloader. So this flashes the bootloader only. So we can exit now the um, terminal emulator and use grab serial again to take a measurement. And we see compared to before, we don't have these UBI messages anymore, so it goes directly to loading uh, the set image here. And we see also the timestamps are a bit lower, so this saves, uh, saves us time when we don't print these UBI um, messages. We also see the um, kernel loading time uh, came a bit down, it's 370 milliseconds now compared to before, it was around 380 milliseconds. And of course, the total time, it's a, uh, yeah, almost by 50 milliseconds uh, improved. What we can do better? I do have a patch here, so this patch is um, uh, a prepared patch which removes several configurations. 
So I'm going to uh, apply this uh, patch to a new branch. I call this branch dash fastboot. I revert the configuration I did so far because it would conflict with my patch I do have here. So I use git checkout to revert the change and apply the, um, the boot fast uh, config patch. So we see here it's uh, mainly red. This means uh, I removed lines here from the configuration. So several functions uh, which I removed here. Um, for instance, uh, also this um, uh, the help um, uh, output of the um, of the commands, which also uh, needs space. So this should really lead to a smaller uh, U-boot binary. So again, I use the SD card. So um, put the SD card into my development host. You see here the binary is now 450 kilobytes. And now the newly compiled binary is uh, 350 kilobytes. So we shoved away around 100 kilobytes of size. I'm going to copy that to our target SD card. Put the SD card into my target system. Use my terminal, terminal emulator again and abort the boot process here. So I use run set update, run update uboot again to update the uboot only. And now using prep serial again to um, make a measurement. And we see now we came down another 50 milliseconds. Uh, so we are now down to 820 milliseconds until the kernel start starts. So this is the second part and now it's about um, the kernel. So I'm going to boot the system here. So the kernel boot starts um, right after the U-boot of course. So after starting kernel, this is the last message of U-boot. The kernel unpacks itself uh, in between and this is the first line uh, of, um, of the Linux kernel uh, printed. So in between here it actually unpacks itself, prints all this um, output here. The actual um, moment when it really starts printing is when the TTY gets initialized. So at that line all the stuff here above is actually being printed on the console. We see also the timestamp here is quite uh, high, so it's uh, around 60 milliseconds between the beginning of the initialization of the TTY. That's because at the initialization of TTY, all the stuff above is being printed. And then here, it's basically the end of the boot process. We are mounting the root file system and freeing some unused memory. So this is basically the last message. And then uh, system D is being uh, uh, executed. So this um, is the start of the um, user process boot user space boot process. So I'm using minus M to um, uh, reset the timestamps at starting kernel and using the dash Q um, to stop the measurement when freeing unused um, kernel memory appears. So here we have a measurement of the kernel um, boot uh, time. Now it's uh, around 2.7 seconds. So we see the kernel, um, kernel timestamps are always a bit lower because the kernel timestamp do not um, include the uh, kernel unpack times. So with using um, defar, uh, with using quit, uh, quiet as a kernel argument, we are going to save time because um, uh, printing to the console takes actually quite some time because it's done syn synchronously. So we see here, this is a measurement with quiet enabled. However, we don't have any messages again, except this warning here. So that measurement basically failed. We do not have our freeing unused memory um, um, kernel message anymore. And 
this um, message helps us to actually keep track of time. So I prepared here a patch which um, elevates the uh, uh, error level of this message, so we will see it even if we are using the quiet command. So I compiled here this kernel image with this evaluated uh, message, with, with the evaluated error level of this message. I'm going to copy this image uh, on my local TFTP server. For kernel development, I usually use uh, TFTP. Um, this is also documented on our developer website, how to set up a TFTP uh, embedded Linux um, build environment. So I put both the device tree and the kernel image onto uh, my TFTP's folder. And my DHCP config makes sure that the file name, so this uh, kernel binary, is being loaded by that particular a module, so I, I bound here the Ethernet, uh, hardware Ethernet address to particular file. So I'm again on the module. What we need now to do is there we have a command which allows to boot from network called NFS boot. So this command. Um, not only boots over TFTP, but also um, start uh, connects uh, or uses uh, NFS um, uh, root file system. However, we we would like to have a root file system from UBI, so I'm going to create a new command called um, U, uh, TFTP UBI boot. So this new command is a mix and match between uh, the NFS boot, so it boots basically over TFTP but it uses the U, UBI uh, FS as, uh, as root file system. So I connect these two commands together. So it sets now the environment for the kernel with the UBI arguments, but uses TFTP, uh, DHCP and TFTP to load. I also set this as my default uh, boot command and save the environment. Now I can do a measurement again using grab serial. I reset the board and we see here it's loading over the network so it's doing DHCP and loading over the network and we see freeing unused kernel memory is being printed. We see a boot time of around 1.12 seconds. So this is between starting kernel and freeing unused memory the end of the sequential boot process of the Linux kernel. So this is already a quite nice um, standard boot time we have here, but we can improve that. There is a utility called KSize. This utility is part of the open embedded core um, layer, so you can, I also um, put the link into my presentation which you can download later to this utility, so this is outside of the uh, Linux kernel tree. And you see here the whole kernel is eight megabytes in size. So all these tables here, they show um, the kernel size of the individual parts. So we see total size eight megabytes, drivers two megabytes, file systems also almost two megabytes, network is around 1.5 megabyte. We see here a drill down of the drivers, so we see 310 kilobytes for USB, 240 uh, kilobytes for MTD, this is the uh, NAND uh, drivers and so on. And then here we see file systems, how large the file system are, so the X file system is our almost 300 kilobytes, NFS file system, NTFS file system is 190 kilobytes. So Depending on, on my project's need, I can remove these features. And I'm going to do this here. So I use make and config. First I remove some file systems. So one can easily remove features from within here. One need to be a bit careful. Some features are required by the init daemon or, or by libraries. So not everything can be stripped down easily. Um, the best thing is to do it a bit in stages, like um, 
remove uh, drivers first and then maybe start to go to different configurations uh, like core kernel configurations. So we're going to skip this. Um, we have now this kernel configured and are compiling it. So the new kernel binary with the um, stripped down config, I'm going to copy it to my TFTP um, host again, use grab serial again, reset the uh, board, and we see we already shoved away more than 10 milliseconds, around uh, 100 milliseconds from the boot time. So removing features definitely helps to improve the boot time. We can start case size also again. We see the kernel already shrunk by two megabytes. So this helps to um, make a small kernel, so it increases actually also the uh, U-boot load time, and it also increases the um, the kernel um, unpack time, uh, decreases, so it, it makes it faster to unpack the kernel. There's another interesting utility called uh, boot graph. This utility is part of the Linux kernel uh, tree. So it's a small script within the Linux kernel tree. To generate data which are required for this script, we need to set some arguments. So I'm going to paste these arguments into my bootloader's um, um, argument. So these are passed to the kernel, and the kernel uh, is um, pr uh, printing enhanced debug data into its kernel log. Uh, the exact arguments will be in the um, in the presentation I'm going to share with you. So we see here now all these arguments are um, in the kernel's um, message log. And I'm going to dump the message log to a text file. So these are now in the bootlog.txt file. And I'm going to copy this uh, text file over to my development host using uh, the S CP, so the secure copy command. Okay, now I take this bootlock, pipe it into this script, and what, what comes out from this script is actually a SVG file, so I'm going to redirect that into a boot um, into a boot.svg um, file. I'm going to uh, open that using Firefox. Firefox is able to uh, show SVG files quite nicely. So we see here the Linux kernel boot process. It's not, not the whole um, kernel boot process, so the unpacking part is basically missing from this log. But we see from the linear boot process how long it takes to in it, the individual system. So UBI takes, of course, quite some time to mount the root file system to initialize the whole NAND um, file system. We see also the other drivers, so SDHC, DCU, so this is the display um, controller, which takes also some time. So depending on, on the features needed, one could probably also remove some of these um, drivers uh, to further increase the boot time. So now in this part, we are going to look, have a look at the user space side of things. I'm using the dash m command again, this time using the freeing unused memory um, message. So dash m means the time gets resetted at that point. So we reset the point, uh, the time when the uh, Linux kernel uh, ended booting. So we see here now, at that line, the Linux kernel stopped booting or did its linear boot uh, part, and then we are going to reset the time and we measure it from that point on um, till the end. So there were also some errors here. The errors come from our self-compiled kernel. The um, modules we have on the root file system are not compatible 
with the um, compiled kernel. We are going to address that later. Okay, so with the system control status uh, command, I see what the state of the current system is. So this is a systemd um, thing, and we see here the system is still in the starting state. The reason for that is um, there were some services which failed. For instance, that modules load service I just told about uh, you about. So I'm going to remove these um, modules because let's assume for my project I don't need it. Um, we have more and more, uh, we make use of more and more modules and one of the modules we are using is the um, for the USB gadget, um, so for the USB device um, service. And also that um, service failed because of course that uh, kernel module was uh, missing. So I'm going to disable uh, the USB gadget service, and with that also the uh, TTY, so we have a serial um, TTY on, on that gadget, um, so on the USB device um, emulated, and I'm going to disable this service too. So we see it removes a symlink from within slash etc, that's what uh, systemd typically does to remove a service from from being loaded. So if it's not linked into slash etc, it's not going to be loaded. There's another interesting tool called systemd analyze. Uh, systemd analyze is not part of our root file system by default, um, so I cannot uh, invoke uh, the command directly. I need to install it, but our old package feeds uh, provide systemd analyze. So I'm going to update the old package feed and install systemd analyze. Okay, so it's downloading systemd analyzing now. Analyze now. Okay. okay, now it succeeded. So we see now system D analyze. The times there were not really useful. Here with uh, system D analyze plane, we see the individual services. So conman service seemed to take quite some time. Um, yeah, and the total time here should basically be the boot time of the system. Um, system the journal flush is also quite big, so yeah, it really helps to kind of see what all gets loaded here, and maybe if not required, one can remove that. One thing we are going to remove here is the conman uh, service. So conman takes care of network. However, we also have uh, systemd and networkd, and I feel like systemd and networkd is a bit smaller. Conman also offers Wi-Fi capabilities. Let's assume our application don't need that, so I'm going to use systemd for the network configuration, which is a bit uh, smaller and one, one service less, which needs to be loaded. So I configure the uh, wired network using DHCP. And then there was also ALSA, so the audio, uh, the Linux audio subsystem, which took some time to restore its state. We also can remove um, or disable that service. We see here that that seemed to have um, successfully loaded. But let's assume our um, our project does not need audio. So I'm going to disable this. We see here it's not removing anything from slash etc. The reason for that is that some systemd services actually um, do not have symlinks in slash etc, but they do have um, only they do live only under slash lib or and are enabled by default. To disable such a service, one would have to use the mask command. So system control mask actually really force disables such a service. 
I mean, this is not really a nice way of uh, disable a service. Um, usually, one would uh, remove the package which this service, uh, which uh, installed that service. So in this um, case, also utils also control. But we see we have dependencies which uh, makes that impossible. So the real um, way to do this is actually to alter the open embedded build system and make sure that this package group base also is not being installed from the beginning. However, to kind of do the development here, um, I just use our um, standard image and going to force remove that package to get rid of it. But one would reintegrate that into a normal uh, open embedded build to kind of make it reproducible and uh, not having that package installed from the start. So let's do a measurement again. I use grab serial, reset the system again. And now we see we are now at about 12 seconds to the login prompt. That's user space only. But um, yeah, it still could be better. Of course, the service could be started earlier than these 12 seconds. So the, 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 uh, the login prompt really marks the very end of the boot process. So I look into system D analyze blame again. It shows quite different data. The reason for that is that system D analyze is not always accurate, especially on a single core system. So we see that actually everything is uh, running and, and okay now. So uh, the state is running, not starting as we had before. So we fixed these issues we had before, but still the uh, blame uh, or the um, output uh, of uh, analyze, system the analyze is somewhat um, strange. We also can generate the SVG um, from that output. So this time I generated the FTP on the module I copied the um, SVG file over to my development host and I'm going to have a look at it using Firefox again. So we see here systemd startup, lots of things uh, happen basically in parallel. However, on a single core system in parallel is not really there. So what basically happens is that a lot of proce processes are competing for resources and usually um, it's not really um, why, it's hard to tell why a process took some time to uh, execute. Usually it's just because also other um, processes have been executed during that time. The one thing, um, so to disable a systemd um, service, one would use systemd auto, auto enable equals disable in uh, open embedded builds to make sure that this does not get actually um, enabled from from the install at install time already. So one thing we see here, the journal appears over and over again. So systemd journal uh, certainly needs some management. So it's it's um, it, the whole boot process is being locked to the device and also the log files need some management. So this takes time. We can now assume that maybe our system does not need logging or we don't want that uh, things get locked um, in the field. So the systemd, journal D, the service which is um, responsible for logging in the systemd environment has a configuration file and this configuration file, so uh, journal D conf allows to uh, disable the actual logging. So I'm going to set storage to none here. Shut down the system. Use grab serial again. And make a measurement again. So yeah, we see that already now we are at around eight seconds. So um, this is to the login prompt. So this already improved quite a bit. 
but we can do even better. Right now we still have quite some serial output. Serial output in user space is not done completely um, synchronous as it's done in the kernel. So the, the kernel can actually uh, schedule a different process, so it's not that huge of a deal. But still it needs some time to uh, print stuff on the serial um, debug console. So with Quiet we, get, we got rid also of these, uh, these uh, prints in the user space and we see we are now at 6.8 seconds. So uh, another improvement of about uh, 1.2 seconds. So now I'm going to show you something different, uh, a different approach. This is basically a bottom-up approach. We are going to use uh, some uh, um, a minimal distribution here called Torrex Tiny. So this is a, a distribution based on Pokey Tiny, and Pokey Tiny is based on the uh, Yocto Project's reference distribution um, po uh, Pokey. So this is really a minimal um, kind of distribution which uh, has a stripped down uh, libc library. So it's not entirely nice to develop with, especially if one would make more complex things, it's not that easy. So we are going to use the Freescale uh, community BSP. Our um, modules, our Freescale based modules are uh, using the Freescale um, community BSP. So our modules are supported by the Freescale community BSP. Here are the instructions to get that uh, BSP. I already did that here. So this is the community BSP, which is making use of um, the Pokey um, Yocto reference um, distribution. So I cloned the Metatoradex Extra layer into um, this um, Freescale community BSP, enabled the, accepted the EULA, and now changed the distribution to Tordex Tiny, and also changed the machine to Colibri-VF. So let's try to build that. I bit bake the core image minimal here. So this, yeah, this throw is not valid. Yeah, the reason for that is I forgot to add the layer to the BB layers config. So I also extend the layer configuration to include this new Toradex extra layer. I use the bit bake command again. And of course, I'm going to skip the whole build process here. So, Toradex Tiny, just to show you what it is all about, the um, Toradex Tiny has um, uh, no real init system. It's just this tiny init system which installs uh, a script in slash init. So, it's really a simple script. I can show you that script that's in here too. So this is all um, more or less copied from the pokey tiny um, distribution. I did some changes for uh, to make it uh, work also from the non file system. So we see here that minimal um, init script. It's basically just um, a bunch of commands. Uh, so some mounting commands, the rectangles application, and then after the real application, we can do um, some more commands like setting up network and so on. But it's really, really a simple um, kind of init system for a minimal system. So I'm going to have a look at the output. We see here the core image minimal uh, UBIFS um, image. So this UBIFS image is basically the same image we usually um, generate uh, with our um, standard image. So we can use our standard scripts again here and overwrite the um, UBIFS um, dot EMG file on the SD card. So our scripts are picking up the UBIFS dot EMG file from the SD card. So I'm just going to use that uh, UBIFS image from this um, Freescale BSP build 
So I use the SD card again, put it into my target system, use run set update, and run update root FS. So this is only updating the root file system. It's quite fast we see here because the root file system is very minimal, so it's only nine megabytes. This includes the kernel. So I also set the different default arguments here, now quiet again, and I set the init system to be the, the script in, uh, stored on the slash, so init equals dash, uh, equals slash init um, to make sure that the init script gets executed. I'm going to make this as the default boot command. So when I boot that, we can see it's really fast, so it's almost instant. Um, so now the system is basically booted. Um, I do have the uh, touch screen not yet calibrated, so I'm going to do this now. I kill the rectangles application here and uh, call the TS calibrate command. So now the now the um, calibration should be done. However, on the slash etc, etc actually the calibration should be stored. Uh, it sh there should be a file called um, uh, pointer call, but that is not there. And the reason for that is the root file system by default in this Tordex tiny distribution is mounted as read only. We can see that here. So slash is read only. We can use the mount command with minus O and remount, so option remount um, RV, so read write. This makes sure that the, um, the root file system gets mounted read write. So we see here now it's mounted read write. We're going to do the calibration again. Okay, calibration done. Let's see whether that file ended up in slash etc. And yeah, we see it here, pointer call. So this is the calibration file. So the calibration now worked. We can start rectangles and when I try that on my desk now, it, it, um, it is uh, calibrated. So I'm going to remount the um, file system read only again and reset the system again here to show you how that looks like. So this is uboot and the kernel and immediately starting the rectangles application, so quite fast. Okay, so this was the hands-on part of the webinar. Um, here at the end of the presentation, I have all this uh, or a lot of the commands which I use during the webinar. So we are going to share this um, with you. So you you have these commands um, too. So these are the kernel optimizations, user space, system D, uh, part two, and the whole Tordex tiny. So this more or less shell script in it stuff. It's also documented here and the links to the relevant layers. Then also Free Electrons has a quite interesting uh, uh, training about um, boot time optimization. I can recommend that too. Okay, so this was the webinar on um, boot time optimizations. Are there uh, questions? So please just write them now and I can try to answer them. So one question was, one could also recompile user space applications with specific flags passed in to remove unneeded features, set the higher optimization level to reduce the time for false application. Um, yes, um, open embedded, uh, the build system we are using mostly uh, definitely allows to do that. So there are, there are um, different things to that. There is one, um, one could uh, create libraries or um, binaries which enable or disable uh, certain features. Uh, Open Embedded has something called package underscore features for that. Uh, 
so one can select which uh, feature a certain package should really incorporate. So one can disable features using that package underscore features um, variable. So that is one thing. And then um, compile options, so like um, optimization levels, they are usually already quite good. So there, there is usually almost nothing to gain from uh, altering uh, the optimization level. However, um, Open Embedded allows to do that too. So for all the packages, one can choose a different uh, um, C flag, so uh, compiler flags, if required. So that's possible, yes. So another question, have you looked at SPL loading in U-Boot instead of device tree? Well, SPL, so the um, U-Boot second program loader uh, is a minimal um, U-Boot which actually allows to, uh, which was invented to um, to boot um, newer SOCs which have too small internal SRAM. Now, I didn't really look into SPL. The reason for that is we, in our, uh, for all, all our modules, we currently do not use SPL. For some modules, we have direct access to the main memory, DRAM, and on Fibrid, the internal SRAM is so large, we don't need SPL. So we didn't really look into that. But probably with SPL, there would be even more uh, optimization uh, optimizations, uh, potential in the um, bootloader area. Definitely agree on that, yeah. Um, there was another question. Is some of those techniques applicable to standard Linux distros? Have you experienced with that? Well, it's a bit complex. With standard Linux uh, distributions, that usually is pre-configured by the distribution. So um, making changes deep in the system is not what these kind of distributions are um, made for. So open embedded and this kind of embedded distributions, they are really um, designed to, to um, alter and to, um, to, to really um, change the core of the system. Distros usually they kind of depend on, uh, on a lot of things uh, being um, already there. Like for instance, you cannot easily swap out the init system in a Linux distribution. Um, the U-boot and kernel kind of um, optimizations, I would say, they would go along with most distributions quite well. So you can use uh, improved bootloader is for sure no problem. Uh, kernel, it should also work uh, to some degree. Usually the kernels uh, which distributions use have some configurations uh, mandatory, so you cannot disable all the um, configurations, but still you could um, use a, um, a Linux kernel which is quite a bit optimized. Uh, any optimizations in the device tree for reducing boot time? Well, yes, you can also disable drivers in the device tree, so by having them not as, um, as okay, but as disabled, you basically can um, have uh, less drivers being initialized and hence reducing boot time. But the better approach is really getting rid of the driver entirely by do not by not uh, compiling it into the kernel. So that's basically the better approach. Uh, but device tree would also already um, improve the boot time by, by quite a bit. Okay, so uh, th there seems to be um, um, Ubuntu minimal uh, distributions, which one of our customers worked on T20 and T30 with uh, his own uh, U-boot and kernel and uh, slightly smaller system D. So it's definitely doable also with uh, standard distributions, uh, boot time optimizations. Can we uh, apply the same optimizations uh, for a Apalis T30? Yeah, um, yes, I would say, the, well, not, not all of them apply one-to-one, -one, so you really need to see, for instance, the level two cache. I'm not sure, maybe it's already enabled, maybe it's not supported, so it, you need to adopt it. Um, also, the kernel is a quite a different kernel. It's a 3.1 kernel, so a bit older. A lot of them should work more or less. For sure, the user space part. So user space is basically um, the same, yeah. 
Although on a T30, typically uh, the, the T30 is mainly um, it's very good on graphics, so uh, using Pokey Tiny or Toradex Tiny on the T30, I'm not sure how well the graphics are integrated there. So it's probably going to be harder to do uh, these optimizations uh, with the Apalis T30. Yes, the hands, uh, hands on video will be uh, there for download. What do you think about switching from INI to SystemD? Our default um, BSP uses SystemD. So SystemD is really nice. I mean, I, I kind of like it. I also use it on the desktop. Um, it is very powerful. It has some very good ideas how to um, how to resolve dependencies between services, etc. However, I mainly feel that Systemd is especially good on multi-processor systems, so multi-core systems. So on now, now, nowadays desktops, it's really, really nice and it's really performing well. On a very small system like the Fibrid um, Freescale modules, um, it's a bit almost overkill because it's, it tries to parallel, uh, parallelize the whole boot process, which is not very helpful if you only have one CPU. And then the other thing is it, it has a lot of components nowadays and a lot of components which might not be needed in a in a um, embedded device. So for simple or for smaller applications like on a Colibri VF50 or VF61, I see that kind of the old uh, script-based init systems have been easier to um, strip down and to make uh, them boot very fast. However, on a more powerful system, I think system D is definitely the way to go. So yeah, we, we use that by default on our VSP, so we like it. <laughs> um, yes, if you disable uh, the, if you don't need the graphics part of the Apollos T30, then um, you can use um, Toradex Tiny too. Yes, that should work fine. Mm -hmm. If I want to disable the Bluetooth device, sound device, I go to config and disable. Yeah, um, kernel configurations definitely. So you can just uh, remove all the configs which um, uh, of devices which you don't need. Um, there are probably still some user space devices when you use our default BSP. So that would be another. Um, point to also disable the Bluetooth uh, kind of services which are provided uh, in our BSP. I think Bluetooth there's not a lot of it but sound for instance the also stuff is um, already pre-installed in our BSP so you, you need to alter the open embedded image recipes to basically disable the sound devices or the sound um, configuration. Does Apalis boot with all four cores? You said Fibrid boots with one. Well, Fibrid only has one core, so it can only boot with one core. Um, typically, Linux uh, first, or U boot at least, starts always with one core. Linux, at the very early start, is also one core, but then it uh, enables all, f all four cores, and also the user space is uh, always um, run in four cores. So whatever is parallelizable is basically uh, done in parallel um, uh, on the Apalis. So uh, it, it will boot with four cores. Yes, uh, for the kernel build, you can disable Bluetooth and sound devices just in the kernel configuration. Um, regarding the um, webinar on pinboxing, I'm going to um, feedback that. We will see. <laughs> Interesting. Um, have you tried uh, kernel execute in place? Not really. Um, well, the problem with execute in place is you need to have um, you need to have a flash system which is um, addressable um, by the memory bus. I mean by direct addresses. NAND flash is not directly addressable from the SOC, so you need to have a NAND driver to actually access the bits and bytes which are stored on the NAND device. So you cannot do kernel execute in place using a NAND um, uh, flash device. With NOR flash devices or memory map devices, um, this would work. However, 
currently we do not have um, uh, any of our uh, current modules uh, have this flash um, on the module, so we, we don't do it basically. Um, I also think it has become a bit out of favor with EMMC and so on. I do not see a lot of device out there nowadays using kernel in uh, ex uh, executing place in, uh, in general. So I think it's a bit fading out. Are there further questions? Just uh, write them. Otherwise, um, just uh, send uh, use our new community. Um, support or uh, send us an email to um, support.arm at tordex.com and we can answer your question at any time. So thank you for joining this webinar and I hope I will see you soon. Thanks.